There was, but I didn't read it. Presumably, parasitic infection increases uh, increases life expectancy. I was skeptical. I didn't read it. <laughs> Saw it this morning. Didn't get a chance to read it. So we'll see. All right, this is where we left off. Fasciola. We're talking about life cycle diversity um, right now. So what we're going to do is go through the life cycle. Giant liver fluke, and we're gonna have ooh, those people watching on YouTube or get sick. Let's see how rooted we are here. I have to adjust that. All right, so that's your. All right, so it's in basically your, your sheep and, and your cattle. And in the sheep or cattle, it's going to live basically in the liver. All right, so uh, the bile duct is going to be its final site of infection, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of get to where it happens. So we're going to start with our sheep or cattle. All right, eggs are going to get released. All right, they're since their final site is the bile duct, all right, it's going to be easy for the eggs to just pass into the lumen of the gut and then get passed with the feces. All right, so this goes into basically a freshwater system where the eggs are going to hatch and release Mare City. Release a Mare City. Now, what kind of controls the eggs from hatching ends up being light. UV light. Uh, not, not really UV, uh, blue, blue violet, the light. So the lower end of the spectrum. All right. And that's a light that is going to be more dominant inside of an aquatic system, inside a water system. All right, your higher wavelengths of light uh, are going to be scattered a little bit more. So, you know, you don't want the egg hatching before it actually makes it into water. Uh, also, you know, if it doesn't get out of feces, it's not going to be exposed to light. So this is one of these adaptations where our parasite's making sure that it's where it needs to be, or at least thinks it knows where it needs to be before it actually hatches. So Mercidium gets released, uh, and then it has about 24 hours before it loses infectivity. All right, so within 24 hours, it is going to have to seek and penetrate our snail host. Right. Now, these are going to go into a specific family of snails, the limnaid snails. All right. We're going to go into a freshwater snail, and inside the snail, that myricidium is going to penetrate out of the gut and develop into a mother spore cyst. which replicates into daughter spore, I'm sorry, mother redia. I'm just gonna deal with these. And then into our daughter redia. All right, so our circarial producing stage is this one. The what producing stage? The circarial producing stage. That's happening all inside the snail, and then once we get to this daughter radial stage, uh, that's when our circaria get released. Right, these are free swimming. They're going to swim around. They're going to attach to substrates where they then insist and transform into metacircaria.
Now, they're going to insist on various substrates, right? But our important one's gonna be on the vegetation. Why on the vegetation? Because it's the vegetation that is typically consumed by our sheep or cattle. Goes down to the water to get a drink, and right? they're gonna get some of this vegetation. They're eating that metacercaria. Now, once this sheep or cattle uh, consumes, uh, the metacercaria. Let's just redo this. Our circarial stage is going to exist. It's going to exist in the gut. Right, so it emerges from our, our circarial cyst. It then penetrates the gut wall. Right, the gut epithelial cells. So that it gets inside the body cavity. Inside the body cavity, then, it will migrate, get to the liver, and penetrate our liver uh, parenchyma. All right, so we left the gut. Penetrate into the liver parenchyma, where it's going to mature for about two months. And then once it starts reaching maturity, it will now migrate to the bile duct. And in about one month more, it's mature and starts to release eggs. That is all happening inside our sheep or cattle. So, kind of big, big thing here. We've got our, our cattle, our host, consumes that metacercaria, right? It needs to get to the bile duct. How does it get there? Well, it undergoes this complex migration here. Not, not necessarily complex migration, but it's more complex than just going to the opening of the bile duct and moving up it. It leaves the gut gets into the body cavity, kind of wiggles itself around our, our gut, or the, the cow's gut, all right, around their intestine into the mesenteries just to get to the liver where they then penetrate into the liver so that they can then mature for about two months before ultimately moving down into the bile duct. All right? So once I, the cattle gets consumes that metacercaria, it takes about three months or so before eggs start getting released. Inside the snail, this, for going from uh, our penetration down to when we start releasing circarias, about five to seven weeks, and that tends to be about the ballpark. So some circarias start to be produced in about three weeks, others can take this five to seven weeks. Yep? Uh, what are the signals that tell them where they are in the body? Good question. Um, Good question. That is a bit unknown. However, uh, it seems like their location is based on what chemicals they detect. Or I should say, their locomotion depends on what type of chemicals. So they exhibit, like, kind of like reach out and crawl, like an inchworm type. Some of them are more moving this way, right? Where instead of going forward, they tend to be moving this way. Others are more rotational. So, uh, It's one of those things that perhaps if they don't detect the chemical that they're looking for, they perform one type of movement to increase the chance that they will start to find that, that gradient. Once they hit that gradient, then it's like, okay, I'm going to start inching forward because I found it. Let's see if I get, I get closer. If I don't, then let's change, alter our, our movement. It's a good question as to how they actually find it. Because again, if they can't find it, that's part of our pathology. 
So if they end up in the wrong place, do they die? They can, they will. Yeah, if they don't end up in the right place, they're not going to mature. So, you know, they're going to cause some damage and then uh, inflammatory responses and ultimately will die. And how, how long it'll take them to die? Could be weeks. Could be weeks. So in our life cycles, uh, what I'm going to try to do is kind of put the stuff in blue that is kind of like uh, some of the FYI stuff. But it's, it's important because it kind of gives that, that idea of, you know, adaptations to increase successful transmission. It doesn't do you any good to hatch while you're still in the feces at all. So we've evolved these mechanisms to, you know, perhaps sense light, percent sense drying, right? So drying out or uh, perhaps temperature is another one. So we're going to see, I'm going to put in some of these adaptations. And this guy, blue violet, blue violet light, that's an Red, red lights, not so much. It's that blue violet light. All right. I am got it. I should have checked this camera before I started going on. All right. So, pathology. It's called fasciolysis. Great name. All right. Very, uh, <clears throat> it is very original. Uh, mm -hmm. It can infect humans and cattle. So humans can actually get this. Eating your uncooked aquatic veggies. Right? Eat like freshwater, freshwater algae and stuff. Right? Notably, uh, fasciola infection is a major case of hyper eosinophilia in France. So excessive eosinophil counts. Which means that our French loving people must be consuming something that has these that are carried in there. And the cattle, you know, real pathology comes to losses, losses to the cattle industry. That losses are going to be tied to mortality, so the death of the, of the cow. It could be reduction in milk production or even meat production. So lost weight, uh, lost muscle mass hurts the cattle industry. All right, this is now you've got. Uh, What's basically happening is you've got damage caused by the worm is siphoning energy away from those processes. So the animal has to repair itself. The animal's fighting this infection. Whatever energy it has, its finite energy source, it's diverted it from production, reproduction, to maintenance, uh, maintenance and uh, immune response. You also have the possibility of secondary bacterial infections. This guy's penetrating out of the gut. It's causing damage. It's penetrating back into the liver. It's causing damage. It's migrating from inside the liver to the bile duct. Uh, that could be significant. Uh, Anti-helminthic treatments are there. However, they are very costly. They are very costly. So much so that some... Farmers just say, you know what, I'll deal with the losses due to this infection instead of trying to treat them. Try, you know, do what I can, move to a new area. All right. And also condemnation of the liver. Basically, liver, you can't sell. It. I, I've tried liver once at Golden Corral because they had it, and I don't know if I would eat it again. Maybe try it one time, one more. If you're gonna try liver, you maybe you don't want to try the golden crab. Right, right. It's if, yeah, yeah. Blood sauce, blood sausage. I was that was all the time. When I was over in Scotland, they had a breakfast dish that was that was I guess made out of blood. I, I tried that. I didn't eat it. <laughs> All right, so yeah, you know, if, if the only thing you're worried about is loss of the liver, then this is where it's take that loss and save the money and not treat it. So what ultimately causes this? Migrating juveniles. That's the underlying source of all of this pathology. All right, they, hopefully they go to where they need to go, but occasionally some of them don't find the liver. They're still moving around. They're still searching. So then they penetrate out of the body cavity into various organs and other organisms. All right, so uh, this is causative agent of liver rot. 
All right, and liver rot isn't just due to the damage caused by our migrating juvenile and the immature worm, but it's also due to the worms in the bile duct, as well as you know eggs that might get lost or, or might get moved uh, and irritate the various ducts in, uh, inside the gallbladder and so forth. So uh, what ultimately happens, really the worms in there causing irritation to the duct, the inflammatory response kicks in, oftentimes leading to thickening of the duct walls, uh, of the bile duct walls. And when you have thickening of the bile duct walls, you lose the elasticity of it. So it becomes harder uh, for the bile to move through. And, and potentially then it gets so thick that it basically blocks the duct, causes the duct to close up completely. And then you can have, uh, you know, gallbladder infections, you know, death of the liver and, and so forth back back pressure. Pressure in and of itself is kind of a bad thing. If you have something in there, and we'll see it with some other stuff, you have a developing cyst of, you know, causing pressure, that can lead to necrosis. So, fortunately for us, this is not really going into uh, humans. All right, did you get this? All right. Next order, plagiorcaformes. Plagiorcaformes. Members in this order show little semblance to each other. Again, very hard to distinguish or to group them together had it not been for uh, genetic sequencing. However, the larval stages do share similar characteristics. So, you know, in, in terms of uh, taxonomy, that's you have to look at the entire picture. You have to look at the life cycle. You have to look at the life step life cycle stages. Now, in this order, we have a suborder of Plagiorchiata. All right, this is the most commonly encountered flukes that we'll see. Uh, they're found in fishes and amphibians and reptiles, birds and mammals and so forth. They're freshwater organisms, marine organisms, and also terrestrial hosts. Most of these guys are parasites of wild animals. However, some are important disease agents in both humans and domestic animals. What's different about this group than our fasciolids is that our metasocaria are going to insist inside a host instead of being on, inside, on, on vegetation. So inside the host, the host that we're going to live in is the invertebrate host. Um, yeah. So the one that we're going to talk about is dichrocelium, another one. So as you get that, clear this up. So family Dicrocelidae. <laughs> We're going to infect terrestrial and semi-terrestrial vertebrates, <coughs> or members of this group. All right, they're going to utilize terrestrial snails and arthropods as first and center, inter, second intermediate host. So terrestrial snails is the first intermediate host, arthropods as our second intermediate host. This group is known for the behavioral changes that it induces in that second intermediate host. And our example that we're going to talk about is Dicrocelium dendriticum or Dicrocelium lanceatum, or you'll see it Dicrocelium lanceolatum, all, right? all basically the lancet liver fluke. So uh, I think most of our textbook uses, our textbook uses dendriticum, uh, other textbooks use den dendriticum. Uh, I think when you do a search, I think Wikipedia listed as dendriticum, but our slide says lanceatum. 
All right, so from what I've been finding, these seem to be synonymous. So, Thecrocelium dendriticum, Thecrocelium lanceatum. It's named for its blade-like shape. Kind of imagine that as being the point, the blade of a dagger or, or the point of a spear. This parasite's going to live in the bile ducts of sheep, cattle, goats, pigs, cervids. All right, basically sheep, sheep is going to be our focus, and then other herbivorous animals because it could go into large antelope species, deer uh, could go into, and so forth. All right, this is primarily in Europe and Asia. It was primarily in Europe or Asia, but it's been introduced uh, to North America and Australia. All right. Right. So, open this up. All right, life cycle. Dicrocelium dendriticum. So, we're going to infect sheep. And of course, we have and other herbivorous mammals. Right, so, more of a generalist here. So it's going to live in our bile duct. Eggs are going to be released with the feces. Easy to get out. Right, so our egg is going to be embryonated. So the myricidium is going to be developed. Right, and it's going to need to be developed if, uh, when our snail comes along and eats that egg. Now, it's a terrestrial snail that this thing is going to infect. We kind of specify. Most of our, our life cycles involve aquatic stages. This is terrestrial. All right, so inside our snail, our myricidia uh, escapes, penetrates the gut. We have our mother spore cyst that develops. That's going to be a constant. We're then going to develop a daughter spore cyst, so that reproduces by our parthenogenesis to get our daughter spore cyst. And then the daughter spore cyst will replicate or, or undergo uh, polyembryony to produce our cercaria. And the cercaria get produced and move into the mantle cavity. M-A-N-T-L-E-M. Into our mantle cavity. So no, I've always had, like, so in the last life cycles, I've had the cercaria get released. And you're going to see this with future ones. Not here. Cercaria accumulate in the mantle cavity. Inside the mantle cavity, they're going to irritate the snail, and the snail is going to increase its mucus production. So what is the mantle cavity? Well, if you think about it, your snail, maybe you say an orbit snail here, you got your head and foot, all right? This man's space here is the mantle cavity. Uh, that's where our gas exchange is going to take place. So the cercaria are going to acu accumulate up there. And when they accumulate up there, they're going to cause the snail to re uh, secrete the mucus. And thus that mucus encapsulates the cercaria. Encapsulates and kind of gets them into a group, which are then released or expelled, as we can say, expelled from the mantle cavity as slime balls. And yes, this is a scientific term. So these slime balls are, are mucus encapsulated encapsulated cercaria. How many of them? Up to 500 cercaria 
inside one of these, these slime balls. All right. Now, what happens when it releases that outer layer of the, that ball is going to dry. And that kind of serves as a protective layer. So it's not really like a spore or a cyst. All right? Now, spores and cysts have that hard outer layer that, that serves to protect whatever is developing inside. This one, it's that mucus layer. The outer layer dries out, and that forms are protected so that these things can survive much longer outside in the environment. Now, it needs to survive long enough so it can be consumed by our second intermediate host. And our second intermediate host are ants. Now, inside the ant, these are caria, so the slime balls, going to be break up, and, and that's the thing. The ants are probably seeing these slime balls and, and think that they're food. That's what's going on. They're, they're going to go consume them. They eat the cercaria. Cercaria or penetrate out of the gut and then insist in the hemocele. All right. And the hemocele is our body cap. This is our insistent metasocary in the hemosphere. Nearly all of them will be insisted metasocary in the hemosphere. One or two metasocary are going to remain uninsisted. And what they will do is migrate through the hemosphere to the subesophageal ganglia. The subesophageal ganglia is, is one of the nerve centers of our invertebrate. And you're going to have one or two metasocaria that go there. They're going to go there and they're not going to insist. These are uninfective. These can get to our next host. So the question is, what did these guys do? What is, what is their role? Those guys somehow induce lockjaw in these ants. So what's going to happen is these guys are out actively foraging. All right, they consume the slime balls sometime. You've got the development. One or two of these, these metasocaria travel to the subesophageal ganglia. They're out foraging, and then nightfall hits. What happens at night? Temperatures drop. So these guys, if you can imagine, are up foraging, you know, leaf, leaf cuttings and whatever. All of a sudden, the temperature gets to a, a spot where these guys bit down to maybe cut a piece of grass or something off, and then they can't let go. And they are stuck there. They are stuck there until the temperature warms up. By the time the temperature warms up enough, it's already too late. Because these guys are locked in onto that blade of grass in the morning hour when our herbivorous mammals are out uh, grazing on the grasses. So it's out, it's stuck, all right? A sheep comes along, feeds on the grass, eats an ant that's, that's attached to the blade, blade of grass. Our metasocary exists in the duodenum. And then it migrates and matures in the bottle duct. So 
So just think of it. Here we have our, our metastercariate, it exists in the small intestine. All right, its final site is the bile duct. It doesn't go outside of the gut. It just moves right back up, right up to where it needs to go. Very simple, easy migration. That's completely separate, completely opposite of fasciola. What happens if one of these guys doesn't get there? The ant behaves just normally, right? But one or two of these will basically quote unquote sacrifice himself for the benefit of the client. How would you decide which one or two does that? Good question. It's pro it's likely genetic, genetically controlled. Or something where it is in their there is in their code where they sense who else is in there or how many are around it, and then one just starts moving on. Some sort of chemical signal. Uh, really unknown. Oh. We don't see three or four or five or six, it's just one or two. There's probably something there that once one gets there, it causes, it releases some sort of chemical or causes the ant to release some sort of chemical so that the rest of the cercaria know somebody's already there so that they can develop. So it's these guys that are the infected. These are and if you think about, you know, how did this evolve? Uh, it only took one to get there. It only took one to get there. So while this is bad for them because that individual never completes the life cycle, all right, it's good for the group because all the rest of them do. And all of these guys in that slime ball, they're all related. They all came from that same Myrcidium. So they're all basically clones. Questions on the life cycle? All right, so this was our life cycle, our Dicrocelium dendriticum. That's a colorized electron micrograph of an ant that is clamps, claps down uh, on that blade of grass. Uh, there's been quite a few studies that have looked at this temperature, and uh, it and it is, but these Ants, they release maybe around 9, 10, 10 in the morning. It's warmed up enough. And of course, if you're in the sun, you release sooner than if you were in the shade. All right. But it's definitely temperature induced. And then they go back to whatever they were doing. All right. It doesn't look like they've been harmed in any way. Pathology, it's called dicroceliasis. Right. Again, clever name, clever name. Uh, and, I, and I have here just C. fasciolysis. All right, for the damage. Uh, we don't have any wandering juveniles that can have, that can occur. These things just move right up the bile duct, but uh, the damage that these things cause or induce due to their irritation of the bile duct and so forth uh, is very similar, basically the same as that caused by fasciolysis. So, you know, we go back and just look to see what, what we talked about here with uh, this. Worms in the bile duct. All right. Next up, order of plagiarcoformes. All right. Our example is Paragonimus westermanni. All right. And in order to get there, we have to go to the suborder Troglotremitata and family Troglotremididae. All right. So just inside this plagiarcoformes. Um, so the worms are old. They're going to be thick. They have a spiny tegument, and their vitellary is going to be dense. And you've seen this in the lab. Very hard to see through the worm because that vitellary is dense. All right. These parasites are going to be parasites of birds and mammals, and they're going to insist in a lot of different things. They can, insist, they can be in the lungs, the intestines, the nasal passages, cranial cavities, other ectopic locations, all right, just... Too, too many to name based on what host and what species we're talking about. Now, the one that we have in lab is Paragonimus westermani. This is an uh, Eastern Asian parasite, right? You can also find it in Africa, Peru, and Ecuador. All right? 
its site of infection is the lungs of mammals. But we can be more specific because our mammals have to consume crab. So we're going to be in the lungs of crabby eating mammals. Is that humans? I don't know about you, but yeah, I like crab. I wish I, I lived more up in the Northwest. It'd be absolutely fantastic. Now, normally, in the wild, it's infecting felines, or dogs and cats. Wild, wild cats, wild dogs, uh, including tigers. All right, you're going to see cases in, in tigers. All right, humans are going to be the secondary host. Why? Because we typically cook our food. All right. So this, this type of parasite would qualify as a zoonosis, primarily in wild animals, but could occasionally go into humans accidentally. Unless it's intentional, if we decide not to cook our food. Now, what's notable about paragonomus is that they usually insist as pairs inside the lungs. And when they insist, they put, you get a granuloma form uh, around these worms. So, you know, it's not, it would be uncommon to find only one worm in the lungs. If you find them, you're typically finding two at a time. All right, so I'll leave that up there. You can kind of get the rest of it. Go to the life cycle. We're going to use cats and dogs as our definitive host uh, instead of humans uh, because these, those are the normal, normal hosts. All right, so instead of cats and dogs, then it kind of implies Fido and stuff. Felines and cats. Right. That's going to be our host. Our eggs are going to be released. Now, how do they get released? We're in the lungs. All right, so that's our side of final infection. So our eggs are either going to come out with the sputum, which is what? Mucus or something. Yeah, the mucus from the lungs. You know, you, you hack it up. So, you know, in this next week, if you hear someone in class coughing up and it seems like a wet productive cough, just, just think, you might be spewing up, you know, some paragonimus eggs. <laughs> And imagine if we swallow that too, that now it goes out the other way. So eggs come out. All right. Now the eggs are gonna get into water. All right. So you know, oftentimes you kind of have the you know water going across. I guess that's what we do. We're in water. All right, they're not gonna hatch right away. They need some time. They need some time to develop before they can hatch. All right, so it could take maybe two to four weeks. So they need to develop, they need to hatch, and then that releases our myricidium. Myricidium is going to actively swim and find our snail host and then penetrate into that snail host. This is another one that infects snails of a specific family, the thylarid snails. Um, and inside this snail, we will, that myricidia will develop into a, the mother spore cyst. And these reproduce asexually to produce redia. Now, I don't have mother or daughter redia because they only produce that single generation of redia. The redia then will produce our cercaria. All right, so our cercaria are of the microcircus type. Microcircus. So 
jerk, this tail. All right, so uh, microcircus is a micro-tailed circaria. So how good a swimmer do you think this thing is? Not really. Not really a good swimmer at all. It barely has a tail. So what this thing's going to do is basically crawl and creep along rocks and substrate. Which is a good thing. Because it's putting it in contact, or at least in the area where its second intermediate host is going to be found. And that second intermediate host, crabs and crayfish. All right, so it's putting it in contact, or at least in the location of these guys. How does it actually infect? Well, it's going to penetrate. So it's moving along trying to find that second intermediate host. And once it does, it's going to attach on and then penetrate it. Probably penetrates near the joints, which is the thinner part of the exoskeleton. And inside, then, we will have encysted metacercaria. And they're going to insist in the muscles and the viscera. So, hearing people hack up, you know, if that doesn't make you think about paragonimus, pay attention to the crab oil, to the shrimp oils that have one of the people like stuck out the, the insides. Viscera. All right. So, we've got insisted metastrocaria inside our crayfish. All right. We then get transfer. When our cats and dogs consume these crayfish. Now, there's some catches to this life cycle. All right. So there is some evidence that these crabs and crayfish can become infected by consuming a snail that has radium and is actively producing these circaria. There's some evidence of this, so you can kind of avoid having the circaria get released and then having to find that host. We also have this part. Peru and Ecuador. What's going on there? It seems like we can also have a peritonic host that will get it into felines, cats, and even humans. And this is probably the primary way in which humans would get it down in South America. What is that? Guinea pigs. This would qualify as a peritonic host. Now, why? So then the guinea, guinea pig then gets transferred over to this. So why would this be popular? Why would we have this in Peru and Ecuador? Because guinea pigs are considered a delicacy down in those areas. No. Yeah, it is. All right. Again, let's go, go down. What? Head down to Petco and look, I try to find furball. Definitely. Now you know. So if you, you know, Dr. Dollar, Dr. Dollar Dixon, go down to the South America, down, down to Central America again, and have the opportunity, you should seek out some guinea pigs. Make sure it's cooked. Just make sure it's cooked. All right, so now once we get back to this felines and canids, what's going on here? This is rather interesting migration, all right, because we need to get to the lungs. So how does it go about it?
So we're going to exist in the small intestine. All right? And then we're going to penetrate the and penetrate uh, and go into the abdominal wall. where our worm stays for a few days. Why it stays there, good question. It's probably undergoing some sort of change, some sort of morphological change, maybe a change in the tegument, so that it can then get to our final site, or at least allow it to survive in that final site. It then re-enters the body cavity. Re-enters the body cavity, penetrates the diaphragm, Penetrates then our pleura of the lungs. All right. And then here, we wait to find a mate. So they hang out there. And they can hang out for several weeks in that area. Once they find a once they find a mate, they move more in, into the lungs. Where they are insisted in a granuloma as a And then, they'll mature and start releasing the eggs. At 8 to 12 weeks. All right? Now, here's the thing about this life cycle. These snails... are in a lodic environment. They're in a fast-flowing river environment. All right. If it releases these snails, or these cercaria, to have tails, and you expect the cercaria to swim to find the host, it's not going to be successful. All right. These things are like swimming. They feel like they are in like a very thick solution when they're swimming. A right. very, very thick mix. So that's possibly one reason why the microcircus cercaria type is going be much more effective. They remain on the bottom, they remain attached on the bottom, kind of hold them in place. Now, if they accidentally become detached or become dislodged, they're lost. They're going to just get swept downstream. So a big advantage or a big adaptation for this is to produce many, many cercaric. So if you can increase circarial output, then you maximize the chance that at least some of them will be able to remain. And the same thing applies for the eggs. So the eggs get into the water. All right, they're just going to get swept downstream. So if you, you know, one of the adaptations then is produce a whole lot of eggs so that you can then guarantee that at least some of our snails will become infected. All right? So cover, and this is just kind of a diagram of our microcircus cercaria type. You can see the tail is just like really, really small, all right? Basically non-existent. And then we also have a reedy of it, so you can see it. All right, so what we'll do is, on Wednesday is uh, finish out Paragonimus and talk about the life cycle of Clonorchus, and then start Schistosoma. All right, our exam is... Supposedly on the 22nd, right? So how many weeks is that? Two weeks. Two weeks. We're going to have to see what's going on here. We'll see how fast the schistosoma goes. How they, hopefully we finish schistosoma when we move to the cestodes on Friday. Are we going to have a quiz on today? Yes. Two quizzes. So, should have had, had an announcement. Uh, we had a quiz went live today. Just, just 
now. Uh, that quiz is our lab is one of the lab quizzes. That quiz is images identifying structures. All right, identifying structures. Uh, you have until the end of the day on Friday to do it, so you can use this lab this week to kind of review the, the the images that we've looked at so far. So including some of the uh, Reedy and and, and Sir Carica. Uh, in lab, we also have a small quiz where I'll set up and you have to identify the pairs in it. Yep. All right. We're done. We'll pick this up on Wednesday. Question. Um, uh, can I get a lab, uh, a key to the parasitology lab, or get one to Dr. Dallas so I can get in once we get started with everything? Yep. 